Good morning, friends. It is time to read the school story part four. I hope that you are excited to hear what happens in the end of this story. So for the end, for part four, we'll be reading chapters 18 through 20. So it's 18 through the end of the book. The long arm of the law. Miss Clayton sat at a table at a small round table in the Linden room with Natalie and Zoe on a Thursday afternoon. It had been just a week since they sent Tom Morton a copy of Natalie's manuscript, but with Hannah Nelson handling the project, there had been rapid progress. Hannah had found ZZ Reisman to be a very cooperative agent. When Hannah offered a royalty advance of $6,000, ZZ accepted right away, not a single counteroffer. Hannah could have paid as much as $10,000 for the book. She had authorization from Tom Morton himself. ZZ, on the other hand, had been told by Natalie to take the first offer with absolutely no negotiating. Accepting that offer without argument, without arguing was one of the hardest things Zoe had ever done. Thanks to Hannah's efficiency and ZZ's cooperation, the entire membership of the Deary School Publishing Club was now staring at a stack of paper on the little round table. It was the contract, all 14 pages of it in triplicate. By signing the contract, Cassandra Day, here and after referred to as the author, would grant permission to Shipley Junior Books, here and after referred to as the publisher, to publish The Cheater, here and after referred to as the work, for the full duration of copyright, which meant all of Cassandra's life plus another 50 years after she died. At the end of the 14 pages, there was a place for ZZ Reisman, here and after referred to as the agent, to sign. And there was a place for Cassandra Day to sign. Cassandra Day also had to write her social security number on the contract. All three copies had to be signed and dated and returned to Shipley Junior Books as soon as possible. Patting the stack of paper, Miss Clayton spoke first. I know I'm supposed to be your advisor, but I really don't know what to tell you. This contract is a legally binding document. I'm pretty sure you have to be at least 18 years old to sign a contract yourself, maybe even 21. And I know you should completely understand all the words before you ever sign anything. Zoe had been enjoying her role as the big shot agent, the queen of the problem solvers. With a little toss of her head, she said, I know all about contracts. You write down the deal, then you sign it. Then you do what it said you would do. My dad says that's all there is to it. Natalie gave Zoe a sideways look. If that's all there is to it, Zoe, then every cab driver in New York City should become a lawyer. Zoe made a face at Natalie and then said, so what do you think we should do, Miss Clayton? Looking from Zoe to Natalie, she said, I don't think we have any choice, girls. We need to talk to a lawyer. Natalie nodded and glancing at Zoe, she said, I agree, a real lawyer. I think we should talk to Zoe's dad. No way, said Zoe, no parents, remember? But remember what you said to me about my mom? It's the same kind of thing. He's not just your dad, Zoe, he's your lawyer. But what if he says he has to tell your mom about everything, said Zoe. He might feel like he really has to. Not if I tell him he can't. If you tell something to a lawyer, he's not allowed to tell anyone else, right, Miss Clayton? Miss Clayton nodded. That's true. So what do you think, Zoe? Zoe shrugged and said, well, I guess it'll be all right. I know my dad can figure out what we should do, and he probably won't charge us anything either. At noon on Friday, Natalie called her mom. She asked if she could ride home with Zoe after school. Her mom said, that'll be fine. How about I pick you up at her house about six o'clock? We'll get some food in the city and maybe I'll call your uncle and see if he wants to see a movie with us. So it was all settled, except Nat Natalie and Zoe weren't going to Zoe's house after school, at least not right away. First, they had to have a talk with their lawyer. Zoe and Natalie walked into the reception area of Crouch, Pruitt and Reisman at 315. Zoe had been to her dad's office only once or twice on a weekday, and that was a long time ago. The receptionist didn't recognize her. The tall young woman put her hand over the mouthpiece of the telephone headset, looped over her right ear. She smiled and said, may I help you? Zoe said, we're here to see Robert Reisman. The receptionist smiled, dimmed, and she said, I see, do you have an appointment? Zoe said, no, but I know he's here. Zoe had called her dad's secretary from school at noon to make sure about that. The reception frowned slightly and raised one eyebrow. And who may I say is here to see him? Zoe smiled sweetly and said, tell him it's his favorite daughter, Zoe. Three minutes later, a surprised Robert Reisman was sitting in a chair across from Zoe and Natalie. Zoe had settled back into the cushions of the couch, but Natalie sat on the front edge. Looking from face to face, he said, so what's going on here? I mean, I'm happy to see you, Zoe, and you too, Natalie, but 
Let's hear what's on your mind, unless this is purely a social visit. As planned, Natalie spoke first. Opening her backpack, she took out the contract and handed it across the coffee table to Zoe's dad. No, this is a business visit, Mr. Reisman. I need to have a lawyer look at this contract. Zoe's dad was already doing that, peering down through his reading glasses, flipping from page to page, nodding his head. He said, this is a publishing contract. Looks pretty standard. What's this got to do with... He stopped in mid-sentence and his eyes fixed on the last page. Looking up quickly at Zoe, he said, ZZ Reisman, the agent for the author? Is this a coincidence? This is a project for class and you want me to look at it, right? Is that it? Zoe smiled, a knowing little smile at her dad and nodded towards Natalie as if to say, ask her. On cue, Natalie said, no, it's a real contract. I wrote a book and my pen name is Cassandra Day and Zoe, that is Zizi, she's been my agent. Robert Reisman sat back in his chair and looked at his daughter. No kidding. Zoe said, no kidding. We wanted to get Natalie's book published and we're this close, but our advisor at school said we needed to talk to a lawyer to see if we could even sign this contract. Leaning forward again, Mr. Reisman said, your advisor at school? Natalie nodded, Miss Clayton, she's our English teacher. She helped us rent the office where we get mail and phone calls. You have, you have an office? Robert Reisman looked from girl to girl as they both nodded yes. Natalie ignored the lawyer's amazement and quickly described the steps that had led to the contract. Then she said, so what we need to know is, can we sign this contract or have it be, you know, legal? Legal? Mr. Reisman was at a loss for words, something that did not happen to him very often. Making a visible effort to think like a lawyer, he said, well, you are both underage, but you have in fact already delivered the manuscript to the publisher, correct? Natalie nodded. The lawyer went on, and it could be argued that concealment of the author's age was not an effort to commit fraud, but merely part of the same principle, leading her to use a pseudonym in order to have her work taken seriously. Is that a fair statement of the facts? Natalie nodded again, expecting that at any moment he would ask her to put her hand on the Bible and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And at any time, did any person at the publishing company indicate that the age of either the agent or the author might affect whether or not the work was acceptable or this contract should be issued? Each girl shook her head no to that. And did anyone ever ask you your age, or did either of you ever volunteer false information about your age to anyone at the publishing company? Again, each girl shook her head no then I think that each of you should be able to sign this contract and have it be legally binding, provided, of course, that each of you have a parent sign an affidavit saying that you are entering into agreement with their full knowledge and consent. He winked at Zoe and said, I think I can find someone to vouch for ZZ. Natalie looked at Zoe and then back to Mr. Reisman. Natalie said, but that's a problem for me. You see, my mom, well, she works at Shipley Junior Books. She's an editor and she's the editor of this book. So I really can't have her sign that, whatever you called it, saying it's okay. I mean, I'm sure it would be fine with her, but I don't want to let her know that it's me until the book's all edited. And my dad, well, you know about my dad. Robert Reisman sat back in his chair again and rubbed his chin. Hmm, yes, I can see the problem. You don't feel free to get your mom's prior consent because if she knew, she could be accused of giving you special treatment. It's called a conflict of interest situation. Hmm. And the lawyer paused again. Then he asked, how about a grandparent or some near relative that we could inform of the situation? That way, if this matter ever came before a judge, we could show that we wanted to make sure you had guidance from an adult who had your best interests in mind. Anyone who fits that description? Instant Nat Nat instantly, Natalie said, Uncle Fred, he's my dad's brother. He lives here in the city and he's the one who helped us with everything after my dad died. And sometimes we go on trips with him in the summer and he comes to our house all the time and we go to his. He's a close relative, right? Zoe's dad asked, do you know his phone number? Natalie said, no, but I know his address and I know that he runs an advertising company called Nelson Creative. Mr. Reisman handed Natalie a pad of yellow paper and a pen and she wrote down Frederick T. Nelson's address. Three minutes later, Natalie was talking to her uncle at his office through the speakerphone on Mr. Reisman's desk. Uncle Fred, it's me, Natalie. Natalie, this is a surprise. Is everything all right? Your voice sounds funny. That's because I'm using a speakerphone. Everything's fine, but I need to ask you something. I'm calling you from the office of my friend Zoe's dad. He's a lawyer and he's helping me with a problem. 
Natalie took about five minutes to tell her uncle what was happening, and Zoe chimed in whenever she thought Natalie left something out. Then Natalie introduced Mr. Reisman, and he and Uncle Fred talked about the details. When he'd explained the legal situation, Mr. Reisman said, I've looked over the contract and it's fairly standard publishing agreement, which means it heavily favors the publisher. Still, if you can sign an affidavit that states that you and Natalie understand what's going on and that until her mom can be informed, you are acting as a next of kin advisor, then I see no reason why my daughter and your niece can't sign the contract and move ahead with this. Fred Nelson said, well, if you think it's all right for your daughter, then I guess it should be fine for Natalie. If you send me the affidavit, I'll sign it and get it notarized and get it back to you right away. Then Uncle Fred said, Natalie? Yes? Way to go, kid. Sounds like a great book. And I can't wait to talk to your mom after she finds out it's yours. And another thing, tell your agent there that whenever she's ready, I've got a job waiting for here at Nelson Creative. Zoe had been slumped on the couch, feeling a little neglected. She perked up and said, thanks, Mr. Nelson. Grinning across his desk at Zoe, Mr. Reisman said, sorry, Fred, but Zoe's already an honorary partner right here at Crouch, Pruitt, and Reisman. Then Natalie said, hey, I want everyone to remember that first of all, she's my agent. Uncle Fred said, well, hang on to her, Natalie. She's pure gold. Natalie beamed at Zoe and said, I know, Uncle Fred, I know. The buzz of the intercom startled Miss Clayton as she sat at her desk marking some eighth grade essays. It was Mrs. Fratchy. The school secretary didn't like teachers getting phone calls at school, but when Mrs. Fratchy disapproved of something, she never tried to hide it. Miss Clayton, there's a personal telephone call for you on line two in the teacher's room. Miss Clayton said, thank you, but, the inter but Mrs. Fratchy had already clicked off the intercom. Thinking it must be Natalie, Miss Clayton hurried down the hall into the empty lounge. She picked up a handset and punched the blinky button. Hello? A, vo a woman's voice said, Miss Clayton? Yes, please hold a moment. And then a clear, strong voice said, Miss Clayton, this is, Ro is Ross Robert Reisman. I'm Zoe's father. H Hello, Mr. Reisman. She gulped and her heart started pounding. Did, did the girls come and, um, uh, and talk to you? Yeah, just left. Tell me about this office, Miss Clayton. Laura Clayton couldn't tell much from his voice. He didn't sound mad, but it wasn't really a friendly tone either. She gulped again and said, well, it's one of those instant office places on Upper Broadway. It's near where I live, so I stopped to pick up the mail. And they have a beeper service so that we, I mean, so that Zoe can return phone calls. Zoe talked on the phone with these people? Well, yes, said Miss Clayton, but, but not a lot, just when she had to. How about the rent on this office, Miss Clayton? I, I was going to explain that to you. When Zoe got the idea to rent the office, Mr. Reisman broke in. Renting the office was Zoe's idea? Oh yes, I was just her, well, her helper. Okay, he said, go on. Well, Zoe brought me an envelope of money. How much money? Miss Clayton winced and said, well, it was $500. Did you say 500? Yes, $500. In cash? Yes, all in cash. Laura Clayton did not feel this conversation was going well. Robert Reisman was silent, so Miss Clayton continued. Zoe said it was her money and I didn't doubt it, but, but I didn't want to spend that money without, well, without permission. So I paid for the office on my own credit card. And what about the cash? I, I opened a new savings account at my bank and it's all there. The lawyer was quiet for a few minutes and then said, Miss Clayton, I'm going to say something and I hope that you are listening very carefully. Miss Clayton was having a hard time hearing anything except the thumping of her runaway heartbeat. Weakly, she said, Yes. Robert Reisman continued, Miss Clayton, I don't know if helping the girls to do all this was wise on your part. However, I do know this. You have been very courageous and I can't thank you enough. I wish you could have been here to listen to those two kids tell me about this deal. This is real learning here. You know what I mean? Real stuff in the real world. I can tell you one thing. I will never again groan when I pay Zoe's tuition bill. If it helps to pay your salary, Miss Clayton, then it's money well spent. Miss Clayton was stunned, and a silly grin crept over her face. She managed to say, thank you, sir. And Miss Clayton, send me a bill for that rent right away, here at my office. Zoe will give you the address, all right? Yes, yes, of course, Mr. Reisman. Don't take this the wrong way, Miss Clayton, but I hope you stay a teacher for a long, long time. Kids need teachers who aren't afraid of life, don't you think? Yes, yes, thank you. No, Miss Clayton, the lawyer said, thank you. Chapter 19, The Red Pencil Blues. 
Six days after the contract had been signed and returned to Shipley Junior Books, Miss Clayton stopped at Offices Unlimited on her way home. Today, the office manager handed a large brown envelope addressed to Cassandra Day, care of the Sherry Clutch Literary Agency. In English class the next afternoon, Miss Clayton passed a note to Natalie and Zoe asking them to come to a meeting. When they were sitting in the small round table after school, Natalie opened the envelope. It was a five page letter from her editor along with a copy of her story. The manuscript was littered with dozens of post-it notes. The yellow ones were editorial suggestions. The pink ones flagged grammar questions. It looked like Hannah Nelson had worn out at least three red pencils. The letter began, Dear Cassandra, Thank you for this wonderful first draft. Now that your contract is all squared away, we can get down to work. Natalie's heart sank. She thumbed through the manuscript, flipping from note to note. Look at all these. This is going to take forever. I thought the book was done, and I thought it was good, too. And look. Miss Clayton took the letter from Natalie. As she read through the first two pages, the teacher began to nod and smile. She was impressed. She said, so now we know what real editors do. This is a wonderful letter, Natalie. She's telling you how to make a good book into a great book. That's all. Your mom really knows what she's doing. Natalie said, yeah, she knows what she's doing, but what about me? Zoe wasn't sympathetic. Quit whining, Natalie. You wanted to be an author and now you are one. So your editor gives you a bunch of good ideas to make your book better. So what? You're an author now, so you have to do the work. Well, you're a big help, Miss Know-It-All, snapped Natalie. Girls, Miss Clayton said, we don't need any sarcasm and we don't need criticism either. Then in a gentler tone, she said, Natalie, just take this home this weekend and see how it goes. Maybe spend half an hour on it. It doesn't all have to be done at once. If you get stuck, well, that's why you have an editor. It's her job to help you to do your best work. Natalie and Zoe went down the front steps of the school. Miss Clayton had sent them on their way together, but neither said a word on the walk through the halls. Natalie got to the bottom of the steps and turned left as she was going to walk to her bus, but Natalie took her by the arm. Wait, Natalie. Natalie stopped and turned her to her face, to face her. Zoe said, listen, I'm sorry I called you a whiner. It's just that, well, I feel like my part in this is all over and I, I don't know what to do. So how do you think I feel, snapped Natalie. I wish we hadn't started this. I mean, my mom almost got fired and she still could for all I know. And now I've got all this extra work to do and I'm still not sure the book is going to turn out right. And then it gets published. And then what if the book reviewers hate it and no one buys it, then what? Zoe looked into Natalie's eyes. The fear and worry was so intense it made Natalie look feverish. Instantly, Zoe was furious with herself for being so stupid, so, so selfish. Then what? asked Natalie. If some reviewer doesn't like it, so what? It just means he's an idiot. How could anyone not like this book, Natalie? This book is so good that even Lethal Lethe, the grump head liked it, remember? And all those little changes your mom, I mean, your editor wants you to make, I know you can figure them out. You're good at this. And your book is gonna get better and better, honest. Natalie smiled a little and said, do you think so? Zoe nodded and said, I know so. Already, Zoe could see that Natalie's eyes changing. She could see her smart, talented, confident friend coming back to life. And with a surge of fierce joy, Zoe could see that her part in all this wasn't over, not by a long shot. Natalie discovered that the editing process wasn't glamorous and it wasn't a lot of fun, but at least it was creative. It was work, slow, steady work. It was careful work to look at every word, every sentence, paragraph, and chapter. It was a methodical tracing of each character, each storyline, each rise and fall of the action, each of the points along with the path that led to the end of the book. And always, everything had to be judged to see if it supported the overall theme and the deeper ideas that made her book more than just a story. During four weeks of revisions, the book got steadily better. Every day, and especially during the bus rides home, Natalie was tempted to ask her mom about the book she was editing, but she didn't. Natalie felt like she would have, it would have been unfair, like cheating. She also learned that the editing process was when an author and an editor got to know each other. When one said, let's cut this out of the book, the other said, no, I really think it should stay. Each learned something new about the other. It was like a very long conversation about, about life. Natalie felt like she was getting to know her mom in a way she never had before. When a note from her mom asked Cassandra Day, does Sean really have to seem so mean at this part of the story? Natalie could hear her mom and dad telling her how important it is to be kind. And when Cassandra Day wrote back and said, Sean's not really being mean here, 
It's just that his feelings are hurt, and the narrator hasn't figured it out yet. Hannah read the note, smiled, and suggested a way to make that clearer to the reader without giving too much away too soon. And during the editing process, the author and the editor come to respect each other's ideas and insights more and more. Near the end of the manuscript, there was a note from the editor about Angela's father. Of all the notes, it was the one that meant the most to Natalie. Cassandra, there are only a few small changes I'd suggest here. This part of the story is so strong, so tender. I think you're, you've caught the essence of the way daughters feel about their dads and the way dads will do anything for their daughters. Every time I read this, I think about my own life and my father and my own daughter's life too. And each time I read it, I weep. It's that good. Several times during the editing, Hannah Nelson invited Cassandra Day to drop by the office if she was in the area or just pick up the phone anytime something wasn't clear. Each invitation to, the, to visit was pol politely refused and the author continued to communicate only by mail. Hannah also found Cassandra's handwriting hard to read. Cassandra's notes were written with thin pencil in tiny letters and the writing had an unusual slant. They looked like that because Zoe was a lefty and after Natalie wrote each note and comment, Zoe copied it out again in her cramped little scrawl. Natalie was sure it was driving her mom nuts, but she didn't want the risk of having her handwriting recognized. Finally, on the fourth pass, the manuscript came back in a new form. The words had all been set into type and laid out in pages. It was called a galley proof, and now each page looked like two side-by-side -side pages from a book, a real book. Best of all, there were only two post-it notes on the whole thing two small errors that were a snap to fix. The book was done. Two weeks later, Miss, Cl Miss Clayton brought Natalie a puffy mailing envelope. It was heavy, and when Natalie pulled the strip to open it, out tumbled two paperback books. Natalie gasped, the book? It's done! But it wasn't the book. It was a paperback printed on flimsy paper, and the cover looked like it had been made from a cheap color Xerox of the jacket. On the black rectangle at the bottom of the cover, white letters spelled out this announcement. Advanced reader's copy, not for sale. Miss Clayton picked up the handwritten note that had slid onto the table with the books. She glanced at it and began reading aloud. Dear Cassandra, our marketing department is excited about your book. So we've printed up 500 of these advanced reader's copies. So far, our salespeople have been using our catalog to tell booksellers about your book. And now they will send these ARCs to all their key bookstore accounts. The subsidiary rights department will be sending them to all the book clubs, the specialty markets, and our overseas agents. Also, the publicity department will be sending out more than 200 ARCs to the trade institutional and consumer review media. I'll let you know when we start getting reviews. The hardcover is already in production and we'll be shipping the advance orders by mid-May. The advance orders aren't great, but a few good reviews should give the sales a boost. I know we rushed a little on the revisions to meet the deadlines, but the book turned out great. You should be very proud. Yours truly, Hannah. Natalie held one of the paperbacks with both hands. She was proud. It wasn't the real book yet, but it was close. Zoe held the other reading copy. She was proud too, but she was also indignant. What does she mean the orders aren't so great? What's the matter with these people? They should be selling these books like crazy. Their publicity people must stink. That's all I can say. Natalie said, remember how my mom said that every year there are more than 5,000 new children's books published in the United States? They can't all be bestsellers, Zoe. It's amazing to get one published at all. Zoe made a face and shrugged. Actually, Zoe heard only half of what Natalie had said. Natalie and Miss Clayton kept talking, but Zoe was busy. She was having a brainstorm. It took only about 30 seconds for a whole new idea to take shape. And when it had, Zoe held up the reading copy and said, can I have this one, Natalie? Natalie smiled and said, of course you can. Then Natalie handed her copy to Miss Clayton and said, and I want you to have this one. I'll ask my editor to send another one for me. Miss Clayton felt choked up, but she swallowed and said, thank you, Natalie. I'm going to treasure this my whole life. Absent-mindedly, Zoe said, yeah, me too, Natalie. But Zoe's thoughts were elsewhere. She had decided it was time for ZZ Reisman to develop some new skills. Zoe thought, I mean, being an agent was fun, but now my client needs something else. What she really needs publicity. Chapter 20, Family and Friends. Most books are published quietly. They don't get big ads in the newspaper, they don't get written about in Time Magazine, and they don't get a publication party. But if it's a book by a famous author, 
or by an author that the publisher wants to impress, then the publisher might send out invitations and throw a little party. Publishers do this to create some news and hopefully sell some books. So when ZZ Reisman called Hannah in mid-April to suggest that Shipley Jr. Books might throw a little publication party to launch The Cheater, Hannah's reaction was, it's a nice idea, but I don't think it makes sense. But then her curiosity took over. All through negotiations and the editing, Cassandra Day and Hannah Nelson had never sat at a work table together, never gone out to lunch, never even talked on the phone. She felt close to Cassandra Day and had loved their little exchanges about the manuscript. She thought, Zizi's right, a little party might be nice, and then I'll finally get to meet this lady. But Hannah had so much to do that she never focused on the idea. Latha had been piling extra work on her ever since the day she'd been appointed as Cassandra Day's editor. Then, three days after Zizi's call, the first review arrived. It was from Kirkus Reviews, and the reviewer gave the cheater special notice with a star, which is like giving a book an A++. Hannah liked the last three sentences best. The cheater grabs hold of your heart and never lets go. This writer speaks with a fresh and honest voice, something always welcome in middle grade fiction. If this first novel is an indication of things to come, then Cassandra Day could emerge as a major new talent. With the review in her hand, Hannah went upstairs to talk to Tom Morton. Hannah read him the review and she proposed a simple publication party on Friday afternoon in June. Tom Morton agreed instantly and that was that. Getting back in the elevator, Hannah had second thoughts. Latha would not be happy about this party, and she'd be furious that Hannah had asked Tom instead of coming to her first. Hannah almost stepped out of the elevator to go back and call it off, and then she stopped and let the doors glide shut. On the short ride from the 16th to the 14th floor, she realized something. Latha was not as scary as she used to be. And then Hannah said to herself, no, that's not it. Latha is actually scarier than ever. It's just that I'm not afraid of her anymore. Back in her office, Hannah called and left a message for Zizi. She said that there would be a small pub party in honor of Cassandra Day's first novel. It would be on the 16th floor of Shipley Publishing Company building on the second fr Friday in June. Zizi was free to invite anyone she'd like to be there, and everyone was very excited about actually getting to meet the author. When Zoe got the phone message, she was excited too, but she kept it to herself. Natalie had finally gotten Zoe to shut up. For a solid week, Zoe had bugged her and begged her and driven her batty. She wanted Natalie to ask her mom if she could bring Zoe and Miss Clayton to see Shipley Jr. books, just to have a look around. Natalie thought it wasn't such a good idea, but Zoe wouldn't let it up. It'll be like a field trip for the publishing club. And besides, school's almost over. Miss Clayton probably won't even be our teacher next year. Finally, Natalie agreed to ask her mom if she could bring Zoe and her English teacher to see the publishing office. And it wouldn't be a long visit, just in and out. And her mom said, of course you may, sweetie. Just bring them with you after school one day. And if I'm too busy to show you around, Ella can do the honors. So it was all settled. They had an open invitation and Zoe stopped pestering Natalie. And this day that looked the best for everyone was Friday afternoon, the second Friday in June. At 3.30 on Friday, June 12th, the editorial staff of Shipley Junior Books started straggling up the, to the 16th floor for, pu for the publication party. The manuscript had floated around a little and there was a definite buzz about this book. And in the, and in the day, the third starred review had arrived. Everyone was excited about meeting Cassandra Day. Hannah had already been up to the large conference room twice, once to check on the caterers and once to be sure that the big banner had been hung up. When Hannah got off the elevator the third time, she could hear the party had begun and she walked to the room. The first thing she noticed was the camera crew. A woman with a large video camera was taking a shot of the banner while a skinny young man held up a bright light. The young man wore a jacket labeled ABC News. A man with perfect hair, perfect teeth, and a pinstripe suit was talking with Tom Morton. Glancing across the room, Hannah caught the eye of Jody Cross, the publicity director. Jody nodded toward the camera crew, smiled, and gave Hannah a thumbs up. Hannah smiled and nodded back. She was impressed that Jody had managed to get some news coverage of such a small event. When Zoe and Natalie and Miss Clayton arrived at the 14th floor reception area, Phil buzzed them right in. Her mom wasn't in her office, so Natalie just started walking her guests around the floor. Natalie had been dreading Zoe's little field trip, and now that they'd arrived, she began to enjoy herself. They started in the art department and slowly worked their way clockwise from area to area. It struck Natalie that it was so odd that so few, few people were around, but she just figured that people had left early on a Friday afternoon. It was nice because they didn't have to be as quiet. Natalie was showing them stages of books, cover, art, and Zoe interrupted her. Let's go find your, find your mom, Natalie. You know, so we can ask her some questions too. 
Natalie shook her head. If she's not in her office, it means she's busy. We'll find her later. Natalie really understood the publishing process now, and Miss Clayton had a lot of questions. It was fun to teach her teacher, and it would have been perfect, except that Zoe was so impatient. They were almost back to her mom's office, and Natalie was standing in Ella's cubicle, pointing at the huge pile of envelopes on the work table. And that's the slush pile. I've seen it when it was even bigger. Turning around, Natalie said, and over there in Tim's office, she stopped mid-sentence. Latha stood in the corridor outside her office, 10 feet away. Crossing her arms, Latha walked toward them. She smiled faintly and said, well, this is a cheery little group, and I see you have a tour guide. Natalie gulped. This is my friend Zoe and my English teacher, Miss Clayton. And this is my mom's boss, Latha Springfield. Miss Clayton stepped around Natalie and held out her hand. Pleased to meet you, Miss Springfield. Miss L Latha looked at Miss Clayton's hand and then shook it briefly. Yes, well, we're happy to have you visit us. Natalie said, we, I, I was going to wait for my mom, but I don't think she's back yet. If she's not back in a few minutes, then we'll just go. We don't want to bother anyone. Latha said, actually, your mother is just upstairs. Then with an amused smile, she added, but I know she'd want to see you and your friends too. Just take the elevator up to the 16th floor and be sure to tell her that I sent you to see her. Natalie nodded and said, sure, okay, thanks. And Latha said, oh, you're quite welcome. As the elevator door opened on the 16th floor, an alarm went off in Natalie's head. It didn't sound right. It sounded like, like a convention or something. Her first instinct was to push another button, any button, and get away fast. Before she could act, Zoe grabbed her hand and pull her, pulled her out of the elevator. Miss Clayton followed and Zoe headed right towards the open double doors of the large room where 50 or 60 people were standing around in small groups, talking loud enough to be heard over the talking of everyone else. Natalie said, Zoe, I don't, I think we'd better, but Zoe said, look, there's your mom. And her tightened, and she tightened her grip on Natalie's hand and headed straight towards Hannah Nelson like a locomotive. Miss Nelson stopped in the doorway, just barely overcoming her urge to flee. Miss Clayton stopped in the doorway, just barely overcoming her urge to flee. Halfway across the floor, Natalie saw a banner, The Cheater by Cassandra Day. Congratulations to our newest author. The camera operator swung to face Zoe and Natalie and her assistant turned on the lights. All but a few people at the edges of the room stopped talking. Everyone craned their necks to see what the camera was targeting. Natalie tried to make sense of the scene around her, but it was all happening so fast. In another three seconds, Zoe was standing in front of Hannah Nelson. There's a good picture. Hannah had been talking to Tom Morton, trying to act completely at ease. So what if the guest of honor was already 30 minutes late? The lights from the camera suddenly blinded her, and when she looked again, Zoe and Natalie were standing right in front of her. Zoe looked up into her face and said, Miss Nelson, I know this is going to be a shock, but I want to introduce you to Cassandra Day. Hannah looked from Zoe to Natalie and then over their heads. Standing in the doorway was a shy looking woman wearing a black skirt and a green cardigan sweater. Hannah's face broke into a relieved smile and she said, well, this is great. Come on, Tom, let's go welcome her. Zoe looked over her shoulder and turned back and said, Mrs. Nelson, that's not her. Putting her arm gently around Natalie's waist, Zoe said, this is Cassandra Day. That's her pen name. Cassandra Day is Natalie Nelson. The camera operator saw it all. As the tape rolled, she thought, it doesn't get better than this. And she was right. The camera saw everything so clearly. It saw the woman look at the girl, completely baffled. It saw the mother's eyes widen, her eyebrows furrow into a question mark, and then smooth to understanding. It recorded the ballet of emotions that dance across both faces. The microphone heard the woman's sharp intake of air, almost a gasp, and then a long breathing out, almost a sigh, and it heard the girl whisper, it's true, mom. Mother and daughter looked at each other for a long moment, and when they hugged, the people in the room and the building and the city around them disappeared. Pulling away, Natalie looked around and then reached out to take Zoe's hand. And mom, this is ZZ Reisman. The woman's face did another dance and then held, and then a hug held the three. And standing over in the doorway, tears streaming down her cheeks, Miss Clayton felt as if she'd just won the New York Marathon. The publicity director dabbed a tear from her eye and whispered to Tom Morton, I don't know how Hannah got ABC News to show up, but I'm sure glad she did. Tom whispered back, she didn't set this up, Jody. She said you got them here. 
The camera was there because Zoe had sent them her advance reading copy to the producer at ABC, along with a full explanation of the story behind the book. And she guaranteed the producer that the author would be revealing her identity at the publication party on the 16th floor of Shipley Publishing Company building at four o'clock in the afternoon on the second Friday of June. The party was pretty much over by 4.30 and Tom Morton invited all the Shipley employees to get an early start on the weekend. After Zoe and Miss Clayton said goodbye, Natalie and her mom walked eight blocks to the Port Authority bus terminal. It was a beautiful June afternoon, but neither of them noticed the blue sky or the springtime bustle along 8th Avenue. They were too busy. The walk was one long question and answer session, punctuated by bursts of laughter, half a dozen hugs, and outrage and impersonations of ZZ, the agent, and Latha, the fire spitting boss. When their bus rolled down the ramp toward the Lincoln Tunnel, mother and daughter sat by, side by side, exhausted but glowing. Hannah cleared her throat. You know, I almost didn't want you to read the book by Cassandra Day because of the parts about Angela and her father. I thought those sections might be too hard on you. Natalie nod nodded. Those parts were hard to write, but I wanted to remember daddy. I wanted to feel what it would be like if he was still here. I don't want to forget about him, not ever. Of course not. You won't. He'd be so proud of you right now. Natalie looked into her mom's eyes. Do you think so, mom? Her mom nodded. I know so. Two weeks later, ABC ran a half hour story on one of its weekly news shows. The segment was called The Publishing Club. The man with the perfect hair and the perfect teeth sat in the studio talking with Zoe, Miss Clayton, Natalie, and Hannah Nelson. As the story unfolded, the viewers saw location shots of the dreary school, the Linden Room, Shipley Publishing Company, Offices Unlimited, and the law firm of Crouch, Pruitt, and Reisman. At the right places in the story, there were short interviews with Arthur Archer, Tom Morton, Robert Reisman, and Fred Nelson. Latha Springfield even got a little airtime, just enough to smile into the camera and say, I guess it's just the result of experience, sort of a sixth sense I have, but somehow I just knew Hannah Nelson was the right editor for the book. The program was perfectly timed with the publication of The Cheater. It offered the kind of opportunity that a good publicity director dreams about. Jody Cross went right to work, and during the next two weeks, Natalie and Zoe spent a lot of time on TV talk shows. They were on Nickelodeon News for Kids, Plus their picture was on the cover of People Magazine. The production manager at Shipley Junior Books almost went crazy trying to keep up with the demand. But at the end of August, the hardcover book had re been reprinted six times and it was the number five on the New York Times children's bestseller list. Zoe Reisman received six offers to purchase the rights to use the name of her company, the Sherry Clutch Literary Agency. After consultation with her lawyer, each officer offer was refused. Three weeks after the program aired on ABC, the president of one of the largest publishing companies in New York called Latha Springfield. He asked her to come be the vice president and the editorial director of the children's division, and he promised that she would have complete editorial control. His offer was accepted. By mid-August, applications for new student enrollment at the Drury School had reached an all-time high. Arthur Archer and the Board of Trustees sent a letter of recommendation to Miss Clayton for embodying so well the ideas of ideals of the dreary school and mr carswell asked her if she'd like to go kayaking some saturday morning the fall alumni newsletter of the bank street graduate school of education featured an interview with miss laura clayton the last question was the hardest for her to answer bank street college if you had to give one piece of advice to the men and women who are preparing to become teachers what would that be laura clayton I've been a teacher for only two years now, so I can't pretend to be a great, some great expert, but I think it's important not to be afraid. Don't be afraid to really listen to your students. Remember what it's like to be a kid and how brave you had to be to try something new. As a teacher, I want to try to be as brave as my students have to be. One week after the departure of Latha Springfield, Hannah Nelson was promoted. She became the editor-in-chief of Shipley Junior Books. It was a big jump for her, but Tom Morton felt sure she could handle it. Sitting in her new office, Hannah Nelson looked out on the Manhattan skyline. She picked up a copy of The Cheater off of her desk. Opening it, she stared at the title page. She smiled, closed the book, and set it back down on her desk and looked out the window again. Then she remembered something. Months ago, she had asked Cassandra Day for the last few bits of text needed to complete the book. She recalled handing the note with those final words to her editorial assistant with instructions that, to be sure that they got added in the right place. Spinning around, she grabbed the book. 
and flipped it open. There, just past the title page, was the dedication. Of course, thought Hannah, how could it be anything else? For mom and dad, for Zoe and Miss Clayton, NN. On the Saturday afternoon before Labor Day, the girls sat on the front steps of Zoe's house eating Italian ices, strawberry for Natalie and lemon for Zoe. It was the first time they'd been together in a month. Natalie and her mom had taken a trip to see the Grand Canyon with Uncle Fred. They stayed at the campground in the forest on the North Rim. It was her mom's first two week vacation in four years. They did a lot of hiking and a lot of just sitting around talking and reading. The peace and quiet was just what Natalie needed. Zoe and her mom and her sister had spent August at their farm in Connecticut and Mr. Reisman had driven up on the weekends. Zoe loved being at the farm, but the peace was a little too peaceful and the quiet was a little too quiet. By the middle of the second week, Zoe couldn't wait to get back to the city. But summer was over now and school was in the air. Zoe pulled a little wooden spoon out of her mouth and said, too bad we don't have Miss Clayton for English this year. Yeah, and I heard that Miss Mr. Alston is a lot harder too. They fell silent again, spooning out chunks of sweet flavored ice, trying to imagine what seventh grade would be like. Zoe said, so what are you going to do with your first royalty check? Natalie shrugged, college fund mostly. I might get to spend some, but not much. And there won't be any money coming until next March, you know. I know, said Zoe. I know exactly when the royalties get paid because agents don't get paid until authors do. The checks come every six months. And I know about how much I'm going to get from that first check too. My dad helped me figure it, figure it out. It's 15% of whatever they pay you. Natalie blushed. I know that's what the contract says, but really Zoe, you should get a lot more than that. I mean, without you, that story would just be sitting in a pile at my house. Zoe wiped a drip off of her chin and shook her head. Maybe so, but without your book, there'd be, have been nothing. I helped get it to the right person, but after that, it was all you. My share's just right. They were quiet, eating again. Then Zoe said, you know, when you write another book, Natalie, it won't hurt my feelings if you want to hire a real agent. Zoe stopped, the last bit of strawberry ice halfway to her mouth. What? Are you crazy? Who could be more real than you? The friends looked at each other and smiled, and Natalie thought, the way this feels right now, I want to put this feeling into a book someday. The end.